Appendix A, Entertaining Questions. We have addressed many aspects of the justifiable homicide issue as it pertains to the defense of the preborn against their assailants. The task has led us on a somewhat vagarious path, delving into matters of eschatology, capital punishment, just war theory, revolution, pacifism, textual criticism, biblical hermeneutics, church history, and American case law. We have defended the use of force to protect the preborn from abortionists. Nevertheless, it behooves us to provide a summary of replies to commonly raised questions. Number one, are you advocating the murder of doctors? No, on three counts. First, we are not talking about doctors, but about hired child killers. Second, we are not talking, therefore, about murder, but about homicide. The question, then, is whether the killing of a serial child killer is murder or justifiable homicide. The revised question, and our third point in reply, is, are you advocating the slaying of child killers? No. We are not embarrassed about stopping short of advocating the slaying of government-approved child killers. Under the circumstances of public idolatry manifested in government-protected abortion clinics, we simply declare that the slaying of even government-sanctioned child killers is justifiable. Since public child slaughter is inextricably connected to national apostasy and idolatry, the means of reform are manifold, and the primary task of all Christians is now, as always, the proclamation of the truth, which leads to repentance. We do not know the best strategy to resist the evil of abortion, but we cannot condemn that forceful, even lethal action which is applied for the purpose of saving innocent children. We remain, pardon the expression, pro-choice. Number two. Ah, come on now. Isn't defending or declining to condemn something the same as advocating it? Why no? Consider our pro-choice friends. They take offense at being called pro-abortion. They are not advocates of abortion. Rather, they are quick to point out they simply support and defend the right of a woman to abort her child. We, in like manner, defend the right of a man or a woman to protect his child. It is a pro-choice thing that many just don't seem to understand. Number three, the sixth commandment says, Thou shalt not kill. How can you defend killing? Obviously, Scripture does not condemn all killing. It legislates capital punishment, Deuteronomy 19.12, Genesis 9.6, and provides guidelines for warfare, Deuteronomy 20-21, 20 and self-defense, Exodus 22.2. Killing is so common, the Hebrews had numerous words to express the act of taking the life of a person. These could be translated variously by slay, slaughter, cut off, pierce, and more. In the King James Version, ten different Hebrew words are all translated by kill. There is no specific Hebrew word reserved for murder. The word found in the commandment, Exodus 20.13 and Deuteronomy 5.17, is used to refer to both lawful, see Numbers 35.27, as well as unlawful, killing, murder. It ought to be clear by the general context of Scripture that unlawful killing or murder, is what is prohibited by the commandment. Nevertheless, etymological clarification does come with the Septuagint, which translates the Hebrew word in the commandment by a Greek word, which is reserved for murder. It is the same word Jesus uses when he quotes the commandment, Matthew 19.18. The clarification between kill, which is amoral, and murder, which is immoral, is enhanced by most modern translations which replace kill in the commandment with murder. E.g., today's English version, NEB, NIV, and New American Standard Version. Those who use lethal force to stop a murderer are not themselves committing murder. They kill, or terminate, or slay, or neutralize. They do not murder. Number four, how can an individual take the law into his own hands and punish another person? That is God's right, not ours. 
The individual, in defending himself or another innocent person, is authorized by God to exercise lethal defensive force. Exodus 22.2 A distinction must be made between the use of defensive force and retributive force, which is reserved for God and those to whom he delegates it. Romans 13, Deuteronomy 19.12 Number 5. Resorting to the use of force signifies hatred, impatience, frustration, and a lack of trust in God. Those who wield force are ipso facto motivated by hatred? We find ourselves awestruck. What about Matt Dillon? How about Superman? Your local policeman? General Powell? Aren't these users of force good guys? We ought to restrain from judging our brothers or anyone else's motives outside the context of a God-based judicial process. We may venture to surmise the condition of a friend's heart and kindly warn him to guard it from hatred and lust for revenge. Likewise, we may warn a friend about our suspicions of his cowardice when he declines to act upon the knowledge that someone is in need of sacrificial, life-saving intervention. But we cannot really know his heart. Only God can see it. Let us judge deeds not hearts. Question number six. We are currently living under a dispensation of grace and the love of Christ in contrast to law. John 1.17, Romans 6.14, 1 John 2.8. So as Christ harmlessly identified with the oppressed, so mustn't we. The two objections are often joined together. The proposition that the ethical and legal Old Testament standards are abolished is wedded to the claim that the passivity displayed in the life of Christ is the norm for Christian behavior. Thus, in the, quote, new dispensation, unquote, which Christ exemplified, there is to be no involvement with the world and no appropriation of its, quote, unquote, weapons of the flesh. Well, the two must be addressed separately. Once we establish the relevance of the whole of scriptures, we can better appreciate the value of the various personal examples within the text. The pacific example of Jesus need not be explained as a product of a new dispensation. Rather, it was consistent with his special role as a sacrificial lamb, inaugurating the kingdom of God with his atoning sacrifice. The quote-unquote new dispensation in the coming of Christ, does not, quote-unquote, abolish the law, Matthew 5.17. When Paul says we are not under law but under grace, in Romans 6.14, he is not invalidating the authority of the law. Cranfield, in his highly acclaimed commentary on Romans, says that this phrase is widely taken to mean that the authority of the law has been abolished for believers and superseded by a different authority. And this, it must be admitted, would be a plausible interpretation, if this sentence stood by itself. But since it stands in a document which contains such things as chapter 3, verse 31, chapter 7, verse 12, and 14a, chapter 8, verse 4, chapter 13, verse 8 through 10, and in which the law is referred to more than once as God's law, chapter 7, verse 22, verse 25, and chapter 8, verse 7, and is appealed to again and again as authoritative. Such a reading of it is extremely unlikely. The fact that, quote-unquote, under law is contrasted with, quote-unquote, under grace suggests the likelihood that Paul is here thinking not of the law generally, but of the law as condemning sinners. There is freedom from the condemnation of the law long ago promised to and even experienced by those with faith. See Genesis 15, 6. But in Christ fully realized. Now in history, with the work of Christ, comes the basis for the grace which was previously shed upon believers and the grace which would be shed in the future. Similarly, when John speaks of a, quote, new commandment, 1 John 2, 8, he is not invalidating the law. Rather, he is pointing to the quote-unquote new meaning and scope of the command to love, quote, in the light of Christ's teaching as to who my neighbor is. And when John says the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ, John 1, 17, he is not contrasting two dispensations, one of law and war versus one of peace and loveliness. There is no hint of polemic against the law. He is not suggesting that there was no grace or truth under Moses. 
Was the law without truth? Was God merciless to the stiff-necked Jews? No. John's point is to awaken the Jews to the significance of Christ, a revelator and deliverer, superior to Moses. Moses is juxtaposed to Jesus throughout John's account. See chapter 5, verse 39, verse 46, chapter 6, verse 32, chapter 8, verse 32 and following, chapter 9, verse 28 and following. Not for the purpose of supplanting Moses' law, but to enlighten them to the fact that Moses, whom the Jews adore, was only a conduit of God's revelation. The Father was the true revelator and has now brought to them the ultimate message through his Son, the only begotten. He has brought them a deliverer superior to the deliverer from Egypt. The apparent harmlessness of Jesus is not a function of the quote-unquote new dispensation. It is an aspect of his personal role as the sacrificial lamb who accomplishes the salvation which Moses wrote about. The fact that the Christians may emulate Christ and replay his death in their own as a witness to the world is not definitive. They may also, as providence provides, perform their duties as judges, 1 Corinthians 6, 2, and kings, Matthew 5, 2 through 5, Revelation 1, 6, Revelation 5, 10, Revelation 26, and Revelation 22, 5. Biblical Christians may respond to a number of divine vocations. They need not be itinerant preachers to fulfill their highest call in this life. They may be bankers, lawyers, judges, street sweepers, hangmen, warriors, or kings. They may do all these lawful things, assuming they execute their duties without violating God's law. Question number seven. What if the slain abortionist might have become a Bernard Nathanson or any number of converted abortionists? The same question could be asked about any one of myriad children who have been wasted. If we must choose between two potentials, what shall it be? The guilty assailant or the innocent victim? The loss of human potential is always a sad fact to contemplate, but the loss issue cuts both ways. What if the abortionist you have decided to spare was about to kill the baby who would have discovered a cure for AIDS? A complicated ethical question for our homosexual countrymen of pro-abortion persuasion. Question number eight. Why didn't Jesus use force to prevent the murder of his own cousin, John the Baptist? Why did Jesus forbid his apostles from going into the lands of Gentiles and Samaritans to preach the soul-saving gospel, Matthew 10.5? Why didn't our great example in life take a wife? Jesus set up no hospitals. He set up no schools. He didn't set up any Bible and tract societies. He didn't even set up a church and gain tax-exempt status. He came not to do all things that are right and good. He came with specific assignments, most importantly, to perform signs and wonders, to fulfill scripture, to preach, and to bear the sins of the world and be crucified. We don't have exactly the same job description that he had. And even at that, the jobs change from time to time in both the life of Christ and his people. He is no longer wandering around on an itinerant preaching mission. He is now subjecting all things under his feet, 1 Corinthians 15.25. Which feet are the people of God, Romans 16.20. Our roles differ from individual to individual and from time to time. There are times to suffer and die, and there are times to overcome and to rule. There are times to stand and watch others die, and there are times to intervene and save the innocent. Number nine. When... James and John asked Jesus whether they might call down fire upon the Samaritans for rejecting him. Jesus rebuked them, saying, You do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Luke 9, 55-56 Here are the apostles, failing once again to understand the purpose of Messiah's coming. His unique incarnational mission was to die one time in all eternity for the sins of the world. His reply is not a categorical repudiation of force and judgment. Obviously, he indulged in such on many occasions. He is Yahweh, the God of Israel. And the wrath of the Lamb, 
would be expected to fall again. Revelations 6, 16. But our Lord, who judges, also knows how to show mercy, and he has no foolish prejudices like those he rebukes in James and John. These two have not understood the fact that God is long-suffering, forbearing, and merciful, desiring the Samaritans to be saved. They retain their hatred of the Samaritan half-breeds and shed no tears over the fact that they are not responding to the truth. Number 10. The force used by Mr. Griffin, who shot the abortionist in the back, was excessive. His action was not wrong because it was forceful, but because it exceeded a more moderate and appropriate amount. These kinds of evaluations were voiced soon after the Griffin event in March of 1993, but were nowhere to be heard after the Shannon event several months thereafter. It seemed as if the almighty sense of humor had providentially orchestrated the irony which came at her hands. Mrs. Shannon used a lesser amount of force, or at least did not wield it lethally, as she shot abortionist Tiller in both arms. But Tiller's triumphal return to quote-unquote work the very next day seemed to muzzle proponents of the limited force ideal. Their objections were exposed as sophistry designed to relieve them from the discomfort of affirming Griffin's deed without qualification. Number 11. If you defend the shooting of abortionists, why not the guilty mothers as well? And what about the abortuary owners and other employees? We could continue the list. How about manufacturers of abortifacients, advocates of abortion, police protectors of abortionists, even false teachers, and idolaters? Certainly, all the lawless and godless shall answer for their crimes. However, it is not the job of Christians to cleanse the land of them. It is the duty of governments, all of which are ordained by and accountable to the triune God, to punish evildoers but it is the duty of Christian citizens to defend the lives of their innocent neighbors when they are under attack and in danger of imminent death. Those involved with the propagation of abortion rights and all the processes leaded, leading up to the commission of the same are distinguished from the one who does the deed. Government has the duty to prosecute conspirators and accomplices. Christian citizens have the duty to defend their neighbors from imminent death. It is true that the mother acts as an accomplice to the murder of her child when she submits to the abortionist's knife. However, efforts to stop her with lethal force would result in the deaths of both mother and child. Furthermore, the mother is distinguished from the abortionist as one who may change her mind and leave an abortuary at any time. The uncertainty of her decision and her inextricable proximity to the victim invalidate her as a target of defensive action. In contrast, the abortionist has unequivocal intentions to kill innocent children. He is a murderer by profession. Number 12. In the long run, use of force will torpedo the entire movement. Face and the application of RICO laws may well be a direct consequence of the use of force. When a criminal faces the death penalty or long prison time for rape, he may be inclined to kill his victim to reduce chances of being apprehended and convicted. Ought the method of punishment be diminished in severity to avoid the undesirable effect of turning rape victims into victims of homicide? Do undesirable consequences invalidate legitimate means? The immediate consequences of the use of force are indisputably efficacious. When an abortuary is destroyed or an abortionist stopped by force, there is an immediate gain of several lives each day that the abortuary is closed. Many never reschedule, and the absence of suppliers always reduces consumption. The short-term consequences are not indisputably detrimental. How many abortuaries have closed? How many have been unable to open in a new location? What has been the effect of increased insurance and trickle-down higher prices to the quote-unquote customer? How many women were impressed enough by the publicity to reconsider their assumption that the child was unwanted when someone was willing to slay another to protect him? And in the long run, how many medical students decided not to become abortionists? What is the resultant consequence of all the discussion of the truth which follows every blast or shooting?
All of these and more factors might be figured into the analysis, and even after speculations are completed, they are not necessarily reliable. If, in the long run, the evil of child slaughter will only be eradicated by force, why, it can be argued, put that day off? It will certainly come to pass quicker if it begins sooner. But these are vain speculations. We have no reason from historical precedent to believe that the pursuit of non-forceful means of saving children from death will be more successful in the long run. And it most certainly cannot be held as superior in the short run. The fact that governments have recently been toppled, India, Poland, Philippines, Hungary, through principles of restraint and nonviolence is not the issue. Better and worse governments have come to power by both forceful and non-forceful means. Certainly, change in power to the good with the least amount of human suffering is preferable. And if we want to replace the present government with a new one, we can consider such issues as the saving of babies versus the saving of citizens through the avoidance of war and the advantages of a nonviolent transfer of power. But we are not even speaking about toppling governments. We acknowledge no experts in tactics of successful national abortion abolition. There are none yet. We respect all efforts to stop abortions of today, tomorrow, and permanently through legislation. We do not discount the power of rhetoric or non-forceful intervention. Neither can we deny the propriety of forceful intervention for the purpose of stopping the killing of a child in immediate danger of death.